Good evening. The Springfield Public Schools Board of Education June 10, 2014 study session is now in order. Welcome to our guests and staff in attendance this evening. We'd like to let the record show that all members of the board are in attendance this evening. However, Dr. Ritter will not be here, uh, but he will be back with us for the June 24th regular meeting. So at this time, we're going to move to 1.02 Pledge of Allegiance. So please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It is our pleasure this evening to have uh, two special recognition items this evening and at this time I will turn that over to Dr. Harrell. Um, Dr. Harrell. Good evening Dr. Frederick, members of the board. Appreciate having the opportunity to present again to you this evening on some celebrations uh, for two of our high schools. Uh, we have Hillcrest High School in attendance this evening for a recognition and we have Central High School in attendance this evening for a recognition. Uh, two very special situations. First off this evening, we have Hillcrest High School's uh, HTV program and their sponsor, Mr. Dave Davis. Dave, if you will come up towards the podium, please. There are many awards that can be received throughout the nation, and many of them with, with a great level of prestige, one of those being the Robert F. Kennedy Award. Uh, Dave, when I used to be the principal at Hillcrest, he kind of told me, this is like, think of it like, since kind of like an uh, a amateur Pulitzer type of thing. It's that level of rare. And in the nation, there is one other high school that has received two of these awards. Um, this evening, we are recognizing Hillcrest High School and their seventh Robert F. Kennedy Award. So, Mr. Davis. Thank you, sir. I said that. Actually, that's what they say sometimes. They call it the poor man's Pulitzer. Um, since this is probably the last public recognition this program will get, uh, the Homeless in the Heartland show. I want to take just a minute. I usually, I, I just want to quote you a few, share a few quotes from the feedback we got that I didn't do initially when we were recognized. Uh, this is uh, pretty interesting. I plan to share the whole show and the bonus site with my students to push them into delving more deeply into topics that require sensitivity and care. You all have done something special here. That's from Decatur, Georgia. Um, an eye-opener for sure. I imagine most of us don't think about teens being homeless, but it's happening right here in front of us, and that's from Springfield. Um, no kid should ever have to experience this. Thank you for making people aware of this frightening issue, and that's from San Antonio, Texas. And the last one is from a small school in Oklahoma where the teacher just wrote scholastic broadcasting at its best. And I thought when we put this online, it was 15 months ago. It was in March of uh, 2013. And we worked on it for three months and had no idea if people were going to get it or not. If it was, Because when you're working on something for three months, you don't know. You, it's hard to step back and say, this is good or this is going to be effective or this is really going to be moved because you're too close to it. And you just have to trust your initial instinct that we had the right idea there. So I want to um, tell you that the Robert F. Kennedy Award is um, one of those awards. I, you guys know about academic contests. They're everywhere. The ones that... Uh, inspire you to do great work that you might not normally have tried. I think those are the best. And the other thing about the RFK award and keeping RFK's legacy um, alive, they give out nine professional, one collegiate, a high school print and a high school broadcast award every year. So there's just 12, 12 awards nationally each year. Um, they're honoring people who give voice to the voiceless. That's kind of the underlying uh, theme to the award and I think that's pretty neat and I think that's what Homeless in the Heartland did. So I'd like to have these students uh, stand up here and just tell you their name and what they did on the show. I think they should get a little bit of time here, not too much, a little. My name is Cody House and I helped film some of the show, and then I put together the accompaniment website that went along with the show that people could go to see bonus content afterwards. My name is Kara Mullen, and I did most of the shooting um, for the studio interviews and also um, some of the field shooting. 
My name is Jonathan Harmon. Um, I was one of the photogra photographers for the show, as well I edited some and I color corrected it. Hello, my name is Caleb Brown. Um, I was one of the uh, main field and uh, studio uh, photographers. And my name is Savannah Steffen. <laughs> I couldn't find my keys, so sorry about that. <laughs> um, I was the reporter for the show, so I did the voiceovers and helped with a little bit of the production. There are, there are four, uh, nine kids worked on this, the four of them that couldn't be here, Kelsey Williams, Kaylee Pryor, our executive producer, was going to be here. Uh, um, help me out here. Uh, Ryan Lindsay and Brianna Feimster. So thank you for, I, I really appreciate it. I've been in this district way too long, almost as long as Mr. Renner, and that's way too long. Wow. Come on. Wow. He was a counselor when I was at Central High School, thank you, as a student. Yeah. <laughs> Got you. I've been wanting to point that out for years. Young counselor. He was. Very young. You were the first high school student slash counselor, right? <laughs> but anyway, um, it is really cool that the school board and the upper administration provide this kind of recognition for these guys. And especially, uh, I mean, it's just a nice pat on the back. You know, we do the work. You hope it resonates. You hope somebody watches. And then we get to come a place like this, and I get to make fun of a school board member. It's really, uh, but it's really nice to be here. And uh, we wish all of us could be here, but uh, these guys really represent what I've been lucky to, the kind of people I've been dealing with in, in R12 for 32 years, HTV for 25. And uh, I'm very fortunate that I get to still do it part time. And I enjoy that a lot, and I don't have as many meetings. So thank you very much. <laughs> Just I, uh, before you leave, we have we have a question. Quick question. I have a question. I just have a comment. As former chair of the Homeless Task Force, I want to thank you greatly for changing the face of homelessness. It has been so hard to explain to people that young people are homeless, and you really captured the sense of that and the and the tragedy of that. So thank you. We need to keep it out there. Make sure people see it and remind them children's lives are at stake. Thank you. Well, the first thing I need to do before we go to the next recognition is apologize. I said Central High School. It is not Central High School. It is Parkview High School. Um, that is, I can't even explain the reason that I did that. I really don't know. <laughs> but we do have recognition this evening from Parkview High School. We have Ms. Didi Moore, who is a business and marketing teacher and DECA sponsor. Ms. Moore, if you would step up. And our recognition this evening, uh, come, on, come on up, Bill. A recognition this evening would be a young name by the name of a young man by the name of Hussan Rao. Hussan uh, competed recently in not only a national level competition, but in fact an international level competition and performed extremely well. And so we're going to have Miss Moore uh, show a bit more about that. Hussein. Hussein is a junior at Parkview, just completed his junior year. And um, our international competition hosted 17,000 competitors. Hussein competed in human resources management. He had to take a 100 question test and complete a role play, which was a case study, a problem <laughs> presented to him and he had to provide a solution. He placed in the top 20 in that preliminary round, <coughs> excuse me, advanced to the final round where he placed in the top 10. He is our first ever junior to be an international finalist. So thank you for your recognition and you will see more. From <laughs> He's amazing. Can I say something? Is this uh, well, to be honest, I wasn't expecting to speak here tonight, <laughs> but given the opportunity, I'd just like to thank my advisor, Ms. Moore, for supporting me through all this and uh, just really shed a light on how important of a program DECA is. I mean, I know Springfield Public Schools provides funding for all these trips, and uh, there's many schools who our students don't get to go because they don't have funding to get to go. And I think that that's just uh, a shame because DECA is one of those programs that just has taken me to levels of success that I couldn't have imagined before. So I'd like to thank Springfield Public Schools, my advisor, and our parents for supporting me through all this. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah.
And Hussein, could you introduce your parents uh, to us? Thank you. Without a doubt, the most fun part of our meeting. We, we appreciate that so much. It's fun to see. At this point, we'll move into our strategic discussion. So if you were here for one of the special recognitions and you uh, have many other important things to do, we will not hurt our feelings if you need to step out at this time and leave. But we will begin uh, Section 3.0 to strategic discussion. Uh, as we move into that, um, one of them might, a couple reminders that our discussion this evening is a continuation of our special budget meeting that was held April 17th uh, and our May 6th study session. And at the conclusion of our May 6th discussion, the board requested additional information uh, related to program expenditures in 2013-14 and then uh, more information on our current budget expansion requests. You will find that information in front of you in a 66-page document. Um, and Mr. Chodas will present additional information, kind of highlight what we ask for within that 66-page document and some additional information. So let's let him kind of work, talk us through that, and then uh, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, at that time. So thank you, Mr. Chodas. Okay, thank you very much. Um, when you look on board docs, you'll see that there are three documents um, assigned to the strategic discussion. Um, I'll kind of work backwards. The third one um, was a request from the board for uh, an expansion of our ranking of the uh, critical needs. Um, the first page is, is a list of the 2.9 million that's been proposed by administration for inclusion uh, in the 1415 budget. The second page is additional expenditures um, that are not uh, at this time being proposed to move forward. The grand total of all the requests is about $7.2 million. The second document is the program budgets. Um, as Dr. Frederick uh, mentioned. Um, and I'll just kind of walk through uh, briefly the, the format that we used. Um, if you look at the uh, first page of the 66-page document, you'll see that the, the first program is elementary. Um, for all the program pages, we have, for salaries and benefits for 1415, we have a note that that's subject to board approval as we continue to work our way through the collective bargaining process. Um, those numbers are not yet finalized. Um, once they are, those, that, those numbers will be updated. Um, in addition, at the bottom of, of each page, if there were any changes between the 13-14 budget and the 14-15 budget, we've identified those changes. Uh, once again, looking at the elementary program page, uh, we will have an increase in salaries and benefits, not only due to the uh, um, collective bargaining process, but also due to the fact that we are uh, proposing adding two FTE for the Academy of Exploration, which will total um, right at $135,000. Um, supplies and materials has also uh, increased, and the difference to the, the explanation for the increase is uh, $25,000 in proposed increase to the wolf slash otter program. Um, and the board might recall that there was also a request for a grand total increase of $204,000 to all site budgets. And 136000 of that is for elementary. Um, so if you take that 136000 and the 25000 for the wolf uh, program, you'll, you will identify the increase for supplies and materials. And finally, there is a request for $101,100 in equipment, and that is also for the Academy of Exploration. And we have uh, done this for all the program pages and um, you know, have identified the changes and have, have also shown some historical information. Uh, the first year shown is 2010-11. Um, 
actual 2011 12 actual 2012 13 actual and then 13 14 budget and 14 15 proposed budget the first document on board docs are the changes since we last spoke uh, at the April 21st I believe um, budget work session um, unfortunately things don't stand still as we go through the budget uh, process so things are constantly changing um, so some of the changes that have occurred include um, further discussions with the county assessor's office uh, which which resulted in a projected decrease well not decrease but a, a reduction of the increase in assessed value from 2.6 percent to 1.5 percent uh, this causes the levy to change from 3.5568 to 3.59, um, which actually results in a 1% increase in property tax revenue, or as you see on the lead sheet there, the $1.1 million. Um, sales tax has been, been reduced by 400000 This is based on the latest DESE projections. Um, that we just received a week or so ago. Uh, m and surcharge is being decreased by 200,000. Um, we now know what the current year m and surcharge is. Um, it's, it's funding that we receive later in the year and the year this year's was down so uh, we are projecting next year's to uh, be down $200,000. Uh, the fourth item is earnings on investments. Uh, I requested that our cash and investments manager look at things again based on the latest information and he's projecting an increase of about $40,000. Uh, other local revenue is uh, declining by about 109000 Once again, it's uh, based on the most recent data. The basic formula uh, or formula funding uh, based on the latest information from DESE, we are uh, reducing that number by 1.8 million dollars um, and that's lowering the proration factor to 96 percent which is the latest recommended uh, information from uh, MSBA uh, number seven is uh, transportation there's a slight increase there uh, the high needs fund there's actually a slight decrease there uh, and then grants, uh, the revenue adjustments for grants. It's a combination of changes that have occurred since uh, January, which was the information that we used at the April 21st uh, budget work session. Um, and there's a correction of a slight out of balance between revenues and expenditures that existed as we entered into the 13-14 school year. Uh, number 10, this is the adjustments of the grants uh, since the board, uh, since, since the January uh, number was finalized. Um, and this is now the expenditure side, whereas the first nine are all on the revenue side. And then finally, uh, number 11, uh, there's about a $1.1 million adjustment in the previous proposed budget uh, when I started looking at it in more detail, I realized that the grant expenditures uh, were inadvertently increased based on projected salary and benefit increases. Um, and as the board's well aware, I've said it many times over the years, grant revenues and grant expenditures uh, should equal each other. So what happened was the grant expenditures were increased with no uh, offsetting increase in revenue. So this is a correction of that situation. Um, when the dust settles, um, we have the proposed budget uh, uh, has a uh, impact on fund balance of a reduction of 323,000 as opposed to the 250,000 that was discussed at the April 21 budget work session. And I'd be glad to try to answer any questions. Mrs. Bush? I think you, uh, on one of these, had it back in um, carryover from this year into next year's. Some million dollars 
put back into revenue that wasn't spent out of this year's budget. Is that correct? Um, if I, I believe what you're referring to is at the end of each year, we have unspent budget. Every, everybody yeah. intends to spend their budget. Yeah. Um, and so that million dollars is actually in anticipation of unspent budget for next year. But because of that, where I'm going with that is we were showing a negative fund balance at the end of this year, but now you think there won't be a negative fund balance because you're showing a carryover. Is that correct? Well, no, this, this, is, this is not carryover. That $1 million has nothing to do with the current year. It is next year's budget that okay. we anticipate will be unspent. Okay. Well, then... Okay, but then this year? This year, the latest projections, uh, you know, the, the revenue numbers, uh, I continue to expect about a three to $400,000 uh, under budget situation on the revenue. Um, the expenditures, uh, the board might recall that the budget for this year included about a $2.6 million uh, reduction in fund balance. Um, I, I am hopeful that we will break even based on the latest information that I have seen. Do you have any other questions? Okay. Uh, clarification, Mrs. Cowan. So you're saying that even with what would be good news, um, to us through our local taxes of a 1.1 million dollar anticipated increase because of the impact at what's happening at the state level and their inability to fully fund their commitment to public education and that's 1.8 that the commitment of our local patrons pretty much is the benefit that we would be receiving from that is pretty much washed out and then some. Correct. You know, I, I just continue, I, I, we cannot thank our local patrons enough for what they have done in the last few years to really get um, our levy. It's still probably not where it needs to be, but it's a lot closer to than where it was because we would be in a lot deeper um, trouble if uh, if they had not done that so I, I just think that um, it's disappointing to me that we make the effort we have leadership at the local level to um, carry through on the commitment that our community has to these students and yet um, our state um, officials cannot do the same and it, it continues to be an incredible source of angst and disappointment. So. You have other comments, questions? Yes. I assume Desi was looking at all the changes made at the end of the session and all the sales tax impact. So this, they've had time to look at all of that and so this is the result of that That's total correct. review? Yes. Um, one thing I might add is um, we appreciate the additional work that went into the budget sheets per department to help us make that kind of that jump from the spreadsheets that you provided then to uh, how that looks for each individual program department. Um, the board had asked for some additional rationale or a description or some assistance with what those changes look like from year to year. So does anyone have any additional requests or do you need additional information when there, when um, the administration has asked for budget expansion in a department or a program? Anything else this time that you feel like you need in addition to this? All right, but I just would like to see that, the um, carryover, the reserve in here somewhere so we can see what's happening. Right, that will be it at the next meeting. We'll, okay. we will present that. I got a question. See, on the uh, the last time we discussed this, we had your revenue project projections going out to 
2016, 2017, I think. Um, have you tweaked those or thought about how, how you're going to tweak those, especially state contribution, or is that something that is just too difficult to figure out? No, it's my intent to tweak those for the next board meeting when we discuss in more detail the budget. Um, and, and I don't know, you know, the governor's office has, has talked about these this flurry of, of tax credits that have just gone into effect that, that nobody knew too much about. Uh, he's made projections about how much that's going to impact. Do we, I know the city and the county are talking about it and whether or not what impact it would have on them. Is that something also that you can kind of get your hands around? Well, I, I do know that there were really uh, two areas of impact. One was local revenue, which really doesn't affect the school district. Um, you know, we're more uh, affected by the statewide sales tax initiatives. And I don't, I don't want to, I mean, I, you know, the city has their own issues in terms of those sales tax changes. else okay so we'll just keep in mind that um, if you do have some additional questions as you know we, we receive this on board docs but we now have a paper copy and as we go through this if we have a, additional questions please be sure to send those forward to administration over the next two weeks because we our plan is to vote to finalize the recommended budget <coughs> at our June 24 meeting is that correct that's the plan that's the plan <laughs> Not much more time after. <laughs> we don't have much time after that unless we call a special meeting right so okay very good uh, thank, thank you. you very much okay. we move into our public comments to address agenda items the Board of Education welcomes comments from the audience about the issues being discussed it is recommended that request to speak be submitted prior to beginning the meeting Comments will be limited to five minutes for each speaker and will be timed by our Board Secretary, Mrs. Luton. Please remember it is inappropriate to address the Board about individual students or individual staff members by name in an open meeting. If you have concerns about individuals, these concerns should be addressed through the appropriate administrative supervisors, either in the school or in the district office. Um, we do not have public comments. Oh, back up do we have one public comment on agenda items this evening okay good so we do not have public comments this evening regarding agenda items but we do want to encourage members of the community to feel free to communicate with us about meeting agenda items uh, typically during this time frame so we'll move to section 5 information item we have two information items before us this evening mr. went and mrs. Graybill will present information related to, to nutrition services and new USDA guidelines. Thank you. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board. Uh, it's my privilege to uh, come before you this evening and to um, touch base on the, the new USDA guidelines that are before us. I'd like to just introduce a, a few folks that are with us this evening that have uh, played a big role in working through with the wellness and the guidelines that we have. Um, as mentioned, uh, Jean Graybill's here as uh, head of our uh, health services, Jeff Rogers uh, with our wellness. We've got three assistant directors from nutrition services, uh, Phil Broyles, Gail uh, Beard, and uh, Kim Keller. And then Dana Nips, who's actually a registered dietitian and does some of our nutrition education. Um, and with that, I will let Jean go into the details and we will try to respond and answer questions that you have. <laughs> Also, Teresa Miller is here who, uh, with us who's been part of the health and wellness education. Um, so it's my pleasure this evening to present to you the new nutrition guidelines for the school district and along with that to provide you some information 
about the district wellness program itself. So we felt like that it's all encompassing and so we want to do that and I promise that I'll be very quickly, I'll quickly go through this because I know you have a lot of information and you've already been sent this information as far as the detailed information about the guidelines and so forth. So I do want to run through this information with you this evening. So for those of you who weren't here in 2006, the, there was a change in the law for the child nutrition and wicket reauthorization that required all school districts who were supported by federal funds to have a local wellness policy established. And within that, there were particular things that we had to address. And one was physical education, nutrition education, physical activity, and other school-based activities designed to promote student wellness as well as the nutrition guidelines for all foods available on a school campus. And then along came the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act of 2010. And so there's some new requirements that are coming along as, as part of this act. So now the USDA has authority to establish those nutrition standards for all schools that are sold, uh, foods that are sold during the school day. And that includes those both that are sold during breakfast and lunch as well as outside the school meal program on the school campus and during the school day. So what's the school day? So now there's a new definition by the USDA on what the school day is. So it's midnight before to 30 minutes after the end of the school uh, day. So that impacts when we can have concession stands and things that are outside of those nutrition standards. And then what does the school campus? Of course, the USDA defined that too. So it's areas of property under the jurisdiction of the school accessible to students during the day. It also includes the school stores, vending machines, and a la carte items but not the sacred faculty workers. Uh, they can keep so what is the sale of food? It has to meet the smart snack guidelines. And you'll see in a few minutes whenever we present the changes to the wellness policy that that's a change from the USDA. So that we'll be presenting that policy for your consideration. But it doesn't regulate foods brought from home. So uh, we're not going to check lunch boxes and bags to say, I'm sorry, that's not nutritious enough. You can't have that. So that is not part of the regulation. So here are the guidelines and standards. So it says that if we're selling foods in schools, they have to meet at least one of these standards. So they have to be a whole grain rich product or have its first ingredient a fruit, a vegetable, or a dairy product, or a protein food. And when you think of protein food, that's meat and beans and poultry and seafood, eggs, nuts, and seeds. And or it can be a combination of food for a quarter cup of fruit and or vegetable, or it can contain 10% of the daily value of calcium, potassium, vitamin D, and fiber. And that is in effect until July 2016. That's going to change, so that will no longer be one of the things that you can consider for qualifying. So here's the news. Uh, we want to be more healthy. And we know that good health impacts the ability for a child to learn. So there's going to be some new restrictions on fats, sugar, calorie, and sodium limits. So for instance, for total fat, it has to be equal to or less than 35% of the total calories for that particular food. So there, those limits were given to you, so I won't go into the other details with that. Also the fruit and vegetable exemption, so we've got some standards, but we have some exemptions there. So they can have a little bit of sugar uh, within the preparation in the light syrups and, when, and uh, um, a small amount of sugar just for processing purposes there. So what's an entree? So this gives you the details of what an entree is for the school uh, lunch program. So it has to be one of those three things that are listed there. But I like to look at it this way because I think pictures speak louder than words. So what this does is it tells you that there are three different components for lunch, for instance, that you have to take three different components. And lunch has to be, uh, it has to have a fruit or a vegetable at lunchtime. So if I have a hamburger, for instance, then that is a grain and a protein. And if I add a piece of fruit with that, then that's my three different components. Okay, so pretty simple and yet complicated. <laughs> Beverage requirements, uh, we can still have plain water, isn't that great? We all need water for hydration, that's important. And there are different stipulations for low fat milk for unflavored and versus flavored and fat free and 100% juice. And then portion sizes are different uh, by grade level too and all, that's, all that comes from the USDA. 
Now, for the district, um, it, it, USDA made some changes as far as what could be allowed for carbonated beverages within the school system. And you'll recall in 2006 that we made the determination that we were not going to have soda uh, carbonated beverages or energy drinks sold during the school day. And we felt that we needed to still stay to that committed commitment to uh, continue to support the good health of our students. Now, fundraisers also are regulated by the USDA, and that means that they can sell food during school, but it has to meet those nutrition standards, which I went over. It has to be uh, defined as far as during the school day, and it can't be sold in competition with breakfast or lunch, and, but they don't apply for after the school hours are off uh, campus events. So if it doesn't meet the nutrition standards, then it has to be distributed after the school, school day. And this has helped us through the state regulation. And so this includes, you know, the candy bars, the cookie dough, the popcorn. So they can give out order forms during the day, but they need to distribute the food to be taken home for, for uh, consumption, but not during the school day. And then if they prepare food in the classroom as part of a classroom curriculum, then they're not supposed to be selling that as well. As part of the curriculum, you don't sell it. You can consume it, but you shouldn't sell it. Now, there is some exemptions for, or, or some regulations that are, are placed for fundraiser exemptions in Missouri. And DESE set that standard of a maximum of five fundraisers per school building per school year um, during, and each of them could have the duration of one day. Well, how complicated is that, particularly when you think of, of Kickapoo High School and you think of all the different clubs and activities, and this is a standard that would say that they could only have five total. doesn't matter if it's art or if it's the history club or the French club. It, it's five total. So we felt like that if they met the standards during the school day, if they're not selling it during the school day, or if they are, it's meeting the standards, and otherwise it's delivered after the school day, that we it would be much less more complicated than what this is. So we think that that's a better route to go. School stores have to meet nutrition standards and they can't be sold during breakfast or lunch. And we did get an exemption from the Department of Ed for the, our sense of pride stores. So kids can earn um, tickets to use to purchase food and, and that consumption is for after school hours as well. So the, the Department of Ed gave us a, an exemption for that and said that that was fine. Vending machines, they have to meet the nutrition standards and that's not changed from what it was before. It's supposed to be turned off during the duration of breakfast and lunch, so again, not in competition. And there are timers on our machines, so that should help. Um, and if, it's, if the vending machines for staff need to be in the staff work rooms, they shouldn't be out in hallways where students have access to them. Now here's something that's different for us as far as rewards and celebrations. We um, felt that we, we needed to continue to support non-food celebrations, so not including foods or carbonated beverages, with the exception of quarterly rewards and celebrations. So at the middle schools and high schools, for instance, they have perfect attendance uh, recognition so that they could uh, provide food during that time, and the official elementary parties, which I'll mention in just a few minutes about those. Non-food rewards are acceptable. Um, and yet we also recognize that we have some students with special needs who they regularly use food incentives in order for them to change their behavior. We're encouraging them to look at non-food incentives for that. This one's a little bit different too. Uh, for school partners, for the local activity, and when we begin to think about marketing to students, this is important for us to, to look at how marketing has changed over the years and, and we're really seeing the emphasis on marketing of children, of foods to children of poor nutritional value and how that contributes to obesity. So we've asked that school partners not provide food or carbonated beverages during the school day unless they're providing for one of the designated parties or the middle or high school quarterly celebrations. Obviously we want them to encourage to provide other non-food incentives and that they will not provide corporate sponsored programs outside the school day in exchange for consumer purchases of foods and or beverages. This doesn't mean that they can't have a particular night designated that they are going to provide um, um, funds to a particular school. It's just that it can't be traded out for consumer purchases of uh, specific foods. School parties. 
Um, this hasn't changed, at least 50% need to be healthy and part and meet the guidelines. And then we changed it through our conversations with principals and uh, PTA to four school parties per year. There were two, you'll recall, from uh, the past. And now they can have up to four, one in the fall, winter, spring, and field day. Uh, we don't want to take away field day. That's awesome, and they love it. And um, this means that they have an option at the school site. So principals and the PTA can make a determination. Do they want one party, or do they want four, or do they want two? So they have the option to choose for that. And this is another way for school partners to be involved to assist with providing at those, uh, at those recognized parties through the year. This one's a change. However, it's something that we've been doing for several years now, and many uh, or several of our schools, elementary schools, have been <coughs> doing this practice for some time with their school partners and not um, using a method in, of food celebrations for parties. So they're choosing to do non-food celebrations, and when I presented this, uh, this year and we had the conversations, the, the principals and the sites were very supportive about this particular change. It becomes very um, difficult, particularly with kids who have special needs, those that have diabetes, those that have allergies, when pr trying to provide um, alternatives for them when there are hundreds of cupcakes that are brought in a single day to a particular school site. So we'll have information on how to support that and other ways that we can provide for recognition for students. Then for an intramural activities and concessions, they have to just wait until after school is over to um, provide for concession stands. And then we also had some regulations from the USDA and as well as the state about whether or not if we have a supported uh, school after school program, should it meet the standards? And that answer is yes. But if it's non-school affiliated, so the Girl Scouts have a meeting there, then it does not have to meet the standards, although we want them to uh, work towards that as well. The state requires that we have food quality and safety instruction for our food service, our nutrition services uh, employees, and so there are some requirements that are there, so they, many of them have already gone through these types of um, in-services. We included the information about student allergy prevention and response because you'll recall that we have a policy uh, regarding allergy prevention and response plans, so we felt that that should be included within our wellness guidelines. Now, not only do we have um, information about nutrition standards, but we also want to emphasize physical activity and the importance of that. So this has not changed. 60 minutes of uh, physical education for students in the elementary grades during the school week, but we wanted to emphasize that th these should be in two 30-minute two sessions rather than one 60-minute session. Here's the thing that we discovered. Um, providing adequate space to allow for safe participation in physical activity. Um, so now we have more kids at school sites. We have uh, foods that are being brought in that we need more preparation, so there's more coolers. And then if we're doing breakfast in the classroom, there's the carts for those, and there's not enough space. So what we found in many of our multi-purpose rooms is that it's all lined with pieces of equipment that are not used for physical activity, which really provides a safety concern for students when we're trying to have physical activity in that room. So for your consideration for the future when you're thinking about uh, issues related to building on or, or that kind of thing, we would certainly want you to consider looking at separate dining areas for students. Protective PE time, that has not changed. This is not new, but we included that and wanted to emphasize that, that PE and recess will not be taken away as punishment. We know that that doesn't work by recess. That doesn't change the behavior by withholding it. Meal times, just to put that up, up there for you guys to see that there are some regulations as far as meal times um, and that kids should have some time to eat there. And this is new at the bottom here where it says must have access to water during meals. That's something that's new from USDA. And so we've got some particular issues related to how close are the water fountains to the cafeterias. So we'll be looking at making some changes as far as access to water during meal times. So what have we done? We've been working on this for a year. Uh, we've talked to the PTA, we've talked to the principal, mul principal groups multiple times. We've sent some information out to the school partners to tell them that, that change is a coming. Uh, I'm doing this presentation to you. We'll be doing some more media things and getting the word out to our community folks to let them know what's going on. So what do we see for the health of our future for our students? 
We believe that um, if we can get access to healthier foods for students, that that's going to improve educational outcomes. So uh, you'll recall that we do have the USDA Farm to School Grant, and so with that we're, we're working on a plan to help improve the access of locally grown foods. That also means looking at our school gardens and sustainability, and really looking at community gardens as well. So all this leads to a healthier child. So that's it very quickly. And we'll entertain any questions that you might have. Questions for Mrs. Graybill? Are the nutrition folks, you know, they came. You ought to ask at least one question about the school lunch program. Okay, thank you. You just led into my question. Um, which, I mean, we kind of got, this got pushed on us pretty much by the federal government with no funding and no support whatsoever. Do we, and you may not be able to answer this question, do we have any idea of how much of this is unfunded from an unfunded mandate, what it's costing us and what we're getting for the meal program that they kind of pushed upon us? I mean, you may not be able to know that it now, be, but I... That would be a Jeff Barnes question. Sorry about that. I knew you, I saw you back there. I knew you'd have that on top of your head. We don't know for sure how much that is. Okay. Because I know it's fairly sizable for some districts that they're hit hard with that. Okay. And another question. With all the guidelines, and could, I have one in school, so I hear about it all the time. How much waste are we seeing with food because kids won't eat the food? That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, um, especially when they're required to take certain items, so they don't have a choice. On some of the programs, like our breakfast in the classroom, they're required to take one of every item, whether they eat it or not, to make it a reimbursable meal. So most of it, maybe they won't eat the apple right then, but they'll keep it on their desk and eat it later as a snack. So that's what we see a lot of. Some of the smaller little guys in kindergarten, they might not drink their milk then. Most of the teachers have a refrigerator and they'll keep it for their snack milk for later on in the afternoon instead of buying snack milks like they have in the past so they're trying to help offset help offset that in different ways so. the last question deals with the, the new regulation not the new proposal for the reducing some of the mandates that Congress is talking about now impact if that goes I don't know if it's gonna pass or not I have no idea but I know it's out there uh, the, the the federal mandates with respect to portions and quantity of food that the kids get. Uh, do you come out. I mean, they've gone back and forth on oh, several I'm, things. You know, they're saying we're going to start now. Okay, we're going to give you two more years. You know, after we've already <coughs> come through the steps to implement things, um, we got a waiver from the government on whole grain pastas. Um, they said that everything had to be whole grain. Um, they found that whole grain macaroni, <laughs> spaghetti, it just doesn't hold up. Like. Not the regular when, pasta, you know, they're finding the quali a quality issue. Yeah, yeah. So, things like that. They have gone back and forth on several items. But I know there were some issues with protein and as far as the quantity because kids were yeah. really hungry at the end of the day when they had football practice and basketball practice. At the end of the day, they and just the didn't is, have they what they everything. Most of them, if they took everything that they could have, they'd be amazed at how much food there is. I mean, because they could take two fruits and two vegetables protein and the grain and the milk. It's just that when they have the offer versus serve and they get to choose, you know, they may just take a fruit and a hamburger and that's a meal. Mm -hmm. So when they made these new rules, it was able to let them have less when they walked out through the line. Mm -hmm. They can have more, but they have a choice. So mm -hmm. that's where it kind of gets crazy. <laughs> We looked into any of the research. I read an article or listened to a story on on the um, data surrounding um, whole fat milk versus low fat milk, and the and that there's really no data. In fact, it's just the opposite that that they're seeing that whole fat milk actually leads to less obesity because it's more filling. There's more. You take out a lot, so it seems, and, and that's just recently come out. But it's, it seems to be a pretty, from what I 
remember reading or hearing that it, that it seemed to be a well-controlled study uh, showing that. If we looked at that and, and determined whether or not um, that's I'm something. kind of tied because we don't have a choice. We can't sell the whole milk. I mean, our, the, le the most of it is a 1% white milk or a skim, fat-free flavored milk, or a skim milk, so plain white skim milk. So we can't sell a 2% or a whole milk. It's in the federal guidelines that we're not even allowed to sell that. And with the new guidelines coming in this fall, we used to be able to sell pint milks at the high schools and middle schools. That's too much milk. They can't have that much. They can only have the 12-ounce milk, so 16 ounces of milk is too much, so. Not, not in our opinion. Not in our opinion, but in their opinion. We'd so rather have them have the, the sweet opinion. Absolutely. So um, as a as a speaker of our nutrition services, we haven't delved into the whole fat milk um, proposal from the research that you've mentioned. Um, even the yogurts that that's off of the whole fat milk that I've researched that they're coming out with new recommendations. But again, because of our regs. <coughs> recommendations from the USDA we're unable to implement those at this time but um, you know with you know the changes that they're making and the they're kind of going back and forth on things it's possible and there's no way to get waivers temporary waivers or <laughs> never know Jerry that was me I was like, like I'm for it I'm all for it but with all the back and forth it, it wouldn't surprise me if that did come, yeah, come back come to forward. light come, come back because to they light. have gone back and forth on all these regulations over the last three or four years and implementing them. So. We, we have another question. Mrs. Callan? Yeah, I just have a couple questions. Um, how will staff, particularly mm -hmm. classroom teachers, parents, and students be notified of the changes? Because I know there's always um, some concern, like I can't bring cookies for my you know, kid's birthday. And I know that that's been in place for a long time, but how do we get that information out to the people that really need to know? About it. Well, we've been we've been working with Teresa Bledsoe and her department, so we plan to roll out a, a plan so that we can get that information out both on the website and and maybe even some printed material. And I thought we ought to do some uh, media things as well, some maybe some announcements too to let them know what those changes are. And we'll be sending the information out to the principals so that they have that too. And we'll be working with PTA. Um, and I've already presented to them on a number of occasions this year, so we're, we're already gearing up to how do we best get that information out to everyone so that they'll know. And who's responsible for uh, monitoring this at each site? I mean, it seems like a lot of particulars, a lot of um, uh, compliance issues that could, I mean, could be non-compliance, but just because of you know an oversight or ignorance or you know I mean it seems like a lot of detail to monitor who will be responsible for that well we we plan to take those guidelines and just put them into little snippets of here's what you can do and present that out to the principals so that they'll know because they are the site administrator that is there um, nutrition services plays a big role in in foods as well that's being sold uh, during the school day so there'll be some monitoring from that and then of course there's monitoring from DESE as well so schools could actually be fined if they're not meeting these standards so we want to make sure that we don't get into that situation and provide the best um, information as possible in a short concise manner <laughs> and then just one more uh, so it's been our policy for a while that taking away recess is not an appropriate punishment is that right Pardon me? We see it that they are taking away recess? That's what I mean. It's been my understanding that if that has been our policy, I'm not sure that that's consistently implemented. And that might be Mr. or Dr. Hackenworth's uh, issue. But so that was in our wellness policy before, right? Yes, those were in the guidelines. Yes, absolutely. I think that would be something that. Well, and we've had the, I've had the discussion with the principals about that. In fact, one of the core, uh, the core teams of principals is already having some discussion about, because um, we talked about that in coming up with ideas for alternatives for, for not withholding recess to provide that information out to sites. So they're going to be working on that. Good, okay, thanks. Do we have any other comments, questions? Thank you very much. All right, eat well. Thank you. <laughs>
I will if I go to eat at the school. Well, <laughs> okay, at this time we will move to 5.02, our internal <laughs> audit report. This is the audited employee background check process. I have Mr. Mueller with us this evening. Thank you. Madam President. Uh, all right, back I, up. Because of a conflict of, potential conflict of interest, I think I need to recuse myself from this discussion. Okay. So I will leave the room. You'll be leaving the room? Okay. No offense, Mr. Mueller. <laughs> That's okay. Um, good evening tonight. I'm here to present to you the um, audit of the employee background check process. Um, I have gone over the details of this audit with you during the May 20th executive session, so I'm not going to go over every finding again with you tonight, but I will be happy to answer any questions. Um, just as an overall, I um, did want to say that the audit went very well. Um, I received a lot of cooperation from the HR staff while doing this audit. And um, the big takeaway from this is that in most instances, um, the district is going above and beyond what is required in terms of um, the initial background check um, that is performed for new hires. Um, so with that, I'll answer any questions. Do we have any questions or comments at this time? Okay, Mr. Hosmer. Uh, one of the, the uh, issues that you uh, brought up in your um, uh, report is the districts, uh, the fact the district does not do a background check of, of employees hired before, is it before 2005? Is that, am I right there? Um, yes. Prior to January 1st of 05, anyone hired before that point um, did not have to go through the fingerprinting background check process. Um, so and, 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 and that statute, so, so there's no statute that says that the district has to do that, correct? That's correct. And so anything that the district did in addition would be more money to, to, to throw at that. Uh, what, uh, and maybe you didn't look at this, but what information does the district get on a yearly basis of current employees, if anything? Um, I know DESE does do a, uh, an annual check on the certified staff. Um, I, I do have Mr. Wagner here from the HR department. He might have a better, more detailed explanation of that if, you, if he'd like to come on up. Uh, DESE does do an annual um, check on all certified staff, but not classified. Okay. So we and, an and, and the annual check is what? They, it's a name check. It's a name only check as far as their database. Name only in terms yeah, they of use the name, social security number, and items of that, and they run it in their certified database, and they let us know if there's any errors or any type of concerns with that uh, particular uh, record. Okay. And, and in terms of, they don't show us everything of every employee. They just, they give you red flags. Something's they only report come up. to us infractions or any concerns that they run through their, their process. And, and uh, correct, me, correct me if I'm, I'm wrong here, but the, we talk about a name only check and a, and a fingerprint check. The only difference really is whether or not you're getting the person that you think you're getting, correct? I mean, you're, 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 you're still accessing the same criminal history database, correct? Yes, the fingerprint, uh, the new hire, the fingerprint matches that individual person and tells us that that's a person who's making the application. Uh, so, so you got quite a bit different cost, but, but assuming you're getting the right person, you're getting all the same records that you would get from a fingerprint. It's just with the fingerprint, you're more, you're more comfortable that the person that you're getting the records on is the person that is in front of you, correct? It's my understanding is the identity match is what it is. Okay. And then the employees hired after January 1, 2005, we did the background check, 
the fingerprint background check on those pursuant to statute, but we don't do yearly other than DESI, correct? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So all we're getting from the recommendation or the or the uh, the option of going back and doing a fingerprint of all employees prior to 2005 is is a little more comfort that we're getting the information about those people that's uh, that we're, we're making sure that that person is the, the information we're getting from Desi correct for the certified staff that'd be correct but um, for the classified staff that were hired before January 1st of 05 there would be um, no kind of background check being done so, okay. yes. so classified staff we get no yearly report from anybody not even Division of Family Services, Children's Division, uh, if they've been hotlined? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Mrs. Bush, just to clarify, prior to that date, we're doing background checks, we're just not doing fingerprint. Repeat that question again. Prior to the, the law that requires fingerprints, we were doing background checks without the fingerprint yes prior to 2005 we were doing a name check yeah we're still doing a background check we're just not sure that that's the person that's using that name uh, the recommendation in here is to go back looking at the cost and perhaps go back and do those and the other is to perhaps internalizing the operation will you be coming to us here I know there's a group uh, looking at the cost and the impact so at some point in the future you'll be bringing that proposal back to either do or not do either of those yes ma'am we're currently evaluating that process and we will be making recommendations to the board on those items thank you so any other questions or comments I just think one last thing I would add is that I'm also interested in um, what is the administration exploring costs uh, related to and potential for fingerprinting all employees prior to 2006 and the district providing possibility of our own fingerprinting service is that things you're looking at yes, yes ma'am okay I, mean, I think that's what she said I just wanted to okay and when could we expect that information I mean, we usually would ask Dr. Ritter but he's not here so we have 60 days of course but <laughs> I'm sure we'll get to you as fast as we can okay okay very good thank you anything else uh, any other aspects of the audit Okay, thank you. Thank you. We are moving now to action items for vote. Uh, if you recall, the administration provided an information update regarding uh, parking lot repairs at our May 20 uh, regular meeting. Uh, the final bids are now available. I understand they were received and opened May 27th. Is that correct. correct? Okay, so they are now before us. So Mr. Went will uh, bring forward recommendations for those contracts, and we will vote on those bids tonight. Is that correct, Mr. Went? That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, as mentioned, uh, this was uh, uh, presented in information form prior to receiving the bids. Uh, the parking lot repairs actually consists of uh, six different sites, Bingham, Campbell, uh, the General Service Center, Holland, Reed, and Shady Dell. Uh, we received bids from three contractors and opened and read those bids on the 27th. Uh, the bid tab is attached, uh, identifying the lowest responsible bidder, highlighted in bold and underlined. Uh, Lee Engineering is the engineer for the project. Uh, these, this, this project would be funded from our major repair. 
Um, in our major repair, we had um, $400,000 that we had allocated for parking lot repair. As you see, the total came in for these parking lots at $419, $940, and $0.53, cents, which means that there are just additional parking lots we would have liked to have done also, but we had to cut off our list at that point. Um, as mentioned, the uh, bid tab is attached, and you can see that Blevins Asphalt out of uh, Mount Vernon, Missouri, was the low responsible bidder, and it is administration's recommendation that the board issues a contract to Blevins Asphalt of Mount Vernon, Missouri, in the amount of $419,940.53 for the Bingham, Campbell, GSC, Holland, Reed, and Shady Dell base bids. So at this time, do we have any questions for Mr. Went regarding the parking lot? No? Okay, so I think what we need now is to have a motion. So moved. We have a motion by Mrs. Callan. Second. And a second by Mrs. Bush. <coughs> so we will prepare to vote. As soon as I get out of here. Thank you. Voting is complete. Now we'll move to 7.0 uh, action items for separate consideration. We have several uh, items for consideration this evening. We'll start out with revision of Board of Education Policy ADF, District Wellness <coughs> Program first reading. Uh, Dr. Hackenworth, will you be doing this? Yes. Mrs. Graydon. Okay, thank you. Good to see her again. <laughs> we just talked about this a few minutes ago, so what we're presenting to you is the information regarding um, ADF, uh, District Wellness Policy, for first reading. So you have the information there that the Missouri School Board's Association Policy Services recommends the attached policy, and, and these are a reflection of those changes, as I'd mentioned, from the Healthy Hunger Free Kids Act. So uh, you've seen the updated policy, so we recommend that the board approves the revised Board of Education Policy ADF, District Wellness Pro Program, for first reading. Any questions or comments? So this is our, be our first reading. Yes. Um, if you have any questions over the next couple of weeks, we'll have a second reading, and then we'll have a final vote in mid-July, I understand, so anything you have comes up, please refer to Mrs. Grego. Thank you. Okay, next we'll move on to 7.02, revision of board policy AH, use of tobacco products and imitation tobacco products. First reading, Dr. Harrell. Good evening again. As the board will recall, we have uh, adjusted to the policies of MSBA and are in transition on our multiple policies into aligning those with those specific policies. Uh, this policy was brought to you in a series of policies under A uh, in 2013. We have received, we quarterly receive updates from MSBA. This is one of the policies that has been updated and they are recommending <coughs> these revisions. We have been a tobacco free campus for many, many years. This revision maintains that tobacco-free component, but does also include those electronic cigarettes, um, tobacco, tobacco derivatives, uh, and other tobacco products uh, included in that particular policy. Do you have any questions for Dr. Harrell at this point in time? Okay, none, thank you. So now we will move to our next 7.04 student attire, um, 7.03, okay. <coughs> tobacco, tobacco derivatives, so that one we just did, 7.03. This is a related policy. This is specifically, uh, policy AH was about the campus itself, okay. uh, whereas policy JFCJ is specific to the student 
but it aligns with that similar policy and works for clarification of that policy and, and explanation for students and for parents uh, and to include tobacco products such as electronic cigarettes, smoking juices, and other paraphernalia. Any questions, comments? Okay. Now we'll move to 7.0 <laughs> for revision of board policy, student attire, and health and safety standards. This is revision of the policy. It does align with uh, MSBA at this point, um, so we did take that into consideration. This was, again, more for clarity uh, and to make sure that the restrictions within the policy met any type of, of current civil or, or state law uh, issues going on. So this board just said an update. That policy had not been updated since 1992. Oh, okay. Any questions, comments? Question. Yes, I know this is always a sticky issue, and it's a matter of judgment. <laughs> What's appropriate, community standards, all of that. Do you have a great deal of difficulty trying to enforce this given the language that you're limited to using is this a big issue the, the policy does allow for a lot of um, it's written to be a little bit more general and allow for a little more flexibility uh, however we have guidelines that are attached to the policy but not part of the policy that helps uh, ensure a little more consistency okay. across the district uh, there are always questions that do come up miss bush yes okay so and you'll have to help me here, Dr. Arnold, but I understand that for the three uh, policies that we just, 02, 03, 04, is it these three that uh, you're requesting that we waive the second reading? Specifically, it's 03 and 04, the student-related policies. Uh, in order to meet printing deadlines for the handbook and to get the handbook online prior to the beginning of school, we're asking that the board would approve these with the first reading as opposed to the traditional full two readings. So I think that means that these two will move to our consent items for vote at our June 24th regular meeting. That would be our recommendation. And that will provide you the time to meet your deadline for these to be in the student handbook. Is that correct? Okay. Um, and then our board policy ADF and AH will just move forward for the second reading at the June 24th and then final approval at our combined July meeting. Is that appropriate? Okay. Appreciate it. Thank you. I think you get to stay up there, though. I do. I do. Okay. 7.05, adoption of local plan for compliance with regulations implementing Part B of the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Federal regulations require that the district uh, approve a compliance plan. We brought a compliance plan to you last year in 2013. We are not required to do that annually unless there are changes to the specific plan. We adopt the DESE model plan. Uh, there were some minor changes to the plan this year, specifically in the area of clarification in wording, uh, alignment to language with MSBA, and then some alignment with uh, the timeline with our First Steps program and the transition into ECSI and the transition then from early childhood special education, ECSI, from there to the kindergarten readiness component. So again, this is a DESE model plan. Uh, it's not a required annual, but we had two years in a row due to changes in the plan. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. At this time, we will now hear from Mrs. Moore. She's going to talk about Springfield Public Schools technology plan. <laughs> so the next three items that you'll be uh, looking at uh, are really the product of several hours, multiple meetings with a cross-functional group to collaborate to meet stakeholder needs. And each of these have been crafted to meet or exceed the state and federal requirements, which we are finding, and they were referenced earlier with the food services and the nutrition services, um, changing all the time. So a lot of the plans that we bring forward, we're not required to do until we are required to do. And then we're not required and we are required. But to not honor those commitments has serious complications for the district. And so several of the plans that we're bringing forward are ahead of that curve in anticipation of possible changes so that nothing happens that has a negative financial or safety impact on the district. 
Each of them um, are represented by key stakeholders who were involved in the process and of course in the summer with vacations and school being out, that's a little bit of a challenge, but we wanna bring those um, things forward. So the first one that you're going to be uh, looking at for the first reading is the technology plan. And I'd like for the people that are here tonight that were involved in any way in the tech advisory to please stand if you would. So we do have a gracious plenty of folks representing multiple departments and work areas. Thank you for your work. And then one of our key principal leaders who is involved is unable to be here tonight because he was or is in the principal How do I make that louder? The technology plan. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> the opportunity to visit with you this evening via video to share our technology plan. The Tech Advisory has been gathering input throughout the year on devices and are working to be more responsive to the needs of all of our students. The plan created has more stakeholder input than ever before and is linked directly to instruction. As we all know, technology is ever evolving, so I look forward to our continuing work. Thank you all very much and have a great summer. I didn't Good quite. Evening, Dr. Oh. Ritter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and unlike the Jetsons, you know, where the screen just goes to black, uh, no guts, no glory, right? Um, but I do think it's important for you to see that the leaders in our schools are trying to meet the demands of the students that we serve. And we're trying to prepare them for a future that we're not even really sure we can adequately envision, much less adequately manipulate with our digital dinosaurness, which is what I have. So the tech plan um, is comprehensive and really uh, balances the needs of the instructional components, integrating them into our adopted curriculum, and then all of the infrastructure, gigabytes, gigahertz, all of the things that run behind the scenes that make that work. And so we bring that plan forward for your consideration and ask that you approve it. Um, of special note are the requirements that allow us to uh, receive E-rate funding, which returns a great deal of money back to the district. So because of the attentiveness to filing this plan and then filling out the cumbersome E-rate paperwork, a large revenue stream comes back into the district that allows us to get a bigger bang for our buck. Any questions that you have? Yes, Mr. Lee. Mr. Power referenced stakeholder input and broad stakeholder input. Would you talk a little bit about who the stakeholder, I mean, were parents, teachers, well, students the, involved in the process? There, yes, um, there is actually a list and what we tried to do uh, that's attached to the information item, it's in the, Attachments. Second, second document. Second document. I'm sorry. It's at the very end. Um, and what I would point out is that the process that we used this year, historically, a lot of the uh, convening happens over a series of one or two months, and um, a couple of meetings, five hours here and there. And what we did this year. Did everybody find it? Am I still waiting? It? Yeah, it's at the end of the action item, not the. It's at the end of the, the action, action item. I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't go That's that when I went to the actual plan itself. So what we did is last year we convened a tech advisory, and so we had met every two weeks last year. We meet once a month <coughs> this year, and then we thought strategically about how can we get the widest range of stakeholder input. Um, sometimes it's difficult to get parents who are shuttling their students to events and trying to be in the stand supporting their children to be there. And so we've leveraged the parent advisory that's been an ongoing topic at each of the monthly sessions with Dr. Ritter and the student advisory as well. And I will tell you that the students are very forthcoming about what they wish adults in the system would do with regard to technology. And so they are holding our feet to the fire. The other thing that we did is we asked for operations to give us principals and teacher recommendations to serve on that advisory and we asked for that cross section of representation. So the people who maybe manage technology like I demonstrated here tonight, uh, along with people like Ms. Uh, Mr. Powers who are very adept. And so we wanted to have that full range of understanding and so they meet monthly 
along with a lot of the district personnel that are there. But we really tried to have it be driven by what we're calling the end users, the people who are in the field that have to use this on a daily basis, who want to push the envelope with tech, but they want to make sure that the infrastructure supports what they want to do. There's nothing more disappointing than you've tried to prep and get everything ready to go, and then you have a technology fail. Because then you don't have faith in the system, you're reluctant to try it again, and that doesn't push the system forward. So we've really tried to use the resources that we have effectively, and then we've created a professional learning plan that bundles in each of the professional learning offerings technology at the point of contact so it's easy for teachers to use. So this cross-functional group has been pushing um, the movement forward. Um, it's very steeped in that, that end user. The list includes only people that made more than three meetings. So there are additional people that were consulted, but we figured if you hadn't attended at least three times, then we didn't want to add your name to the list. Any questions, comments? Um, I think I, I, or I do have one uh, question. In reading the technology plan, it's very ambitious. It's very thorough. It's very complete. My question is, do we have appropriate dollars budgeted? to ensure that all this plan will be implemented? You're probably asking the wrong person. Um, I don't think you ever have enough to do everything that you'd like to do. And of concern to me is that um, because the budget for a couple of years, we're trying to kind of regain that ground, um, we have to do a look at the needs across the district, and tech is only one part of that. But we have had uh, an explosion of tech use We've had an explosion of work orders in the last several months, and comparative staffing to surrounding districts our size were a little bit lean, and there comes a point at which there's a break-even point. We've tried to be appropriate in our budget expansion and recognize, and you've heard me advocate in the budget hearings, we've got to look at all the needs of the district, and so even though IT is in my division, we can't do IT to the exclusion of everything else, but we do have to be concerned about having the staff to be able to adequately push that forward. Well, I, I, I guess my biggest concern was when I get to page four and we start talking about re replace and maintain, replace and maintain outdated computer equipment on an annual basis to maintain or improve student to computer ratios. That's each year, making sure we have adequate. You're not yes. replacing everything each year. And no, no, we're not. Replace Mr. And Green, and I may let him speak to that if you'd like no, to know more. He's spoken extensively about that replacement cycle. He is. Uh, squeaking the coins, you know, just as tight as he can to come up with a realistic replacement cycle, but it's like anything else in your house. If you don't do that regular maintenance, then you just get hit with a huge, ginormous bill, and he's been a very good steward of district funds to kind of move that forward. And the cost of staffing to maintain old equipment, which is not a good use of funds either. Yeah. And does he want to speak to, as of February 2014, our district ratio is 1 to 732 computers. Is that one? I'm going to let him go to the mic. The, uh, DESE, one standard, staff. the DESE standard is 250 devices to one's technical staff support member. We're at 732 devices to one technical staff support. We so we're doing that? a much better job. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> we can do. Our people can do the work of three regular. He, he's really kind, and he they're a can-do group of folks. But there's a point at which it, it we, we're going to be in trouble. The line is tight. It's about to break. <laughs> so how do we fix that? Uh, just additional staffing. I think you see a budget proposal that we have. We're working for trying to get the middle schools covered because there's a lot of technology in the middle schools. So we're, we've got some plans for the next few years to try to make those moves but try to be at least uh, good stewards of district funding to do that I mean, it strikes me and I've and I've talked about this before but I know there are a number of districts that are kind of looking at this and kind of looking at this idea and saying that that you know districts can start creating their own curriculum and creating their own books and creating their own content uh, and then the line item for curriculum adoption and, and purchase of textbooks can be then moved over into the technology realm. Uh, and then the other thing that, that districts are looking at, I think you have to look at is what the reality is, you know, where kids are getting information, where adults are getting information. Every one of us at this table have smartphones and, and getting 
more and more of our information from smartphones and for a district to kind of say, well, we're going to keep doing desktop computers or laptops or whatever, I think you kind of miss that where kids already are. And so, you know, if you, if you look at the, the 20 years out, 10 years out, you know, maybe there's ways to shake down some money from buying textbooks that are outdated the moment they are plopped down on some student's desk uh, to uh, creating your own data, which is ever-evolving and, and, and always updating. You are probably preaching to the choir with that, right. and I'm thinking about the staff behind me. The difficult part to manage is the transition point because um, it's a misnomer that all of the online resources are completely free. So some of them you still have to pay for, right? And you've got to have a device for every student to be able to do that. And so Mr. Green and his staff have been working to kind of flood the devices. Uh, Dr. Hagerman in information literacy operations, we're trying to get as many devices into schools as we can, but it's a slow process. And so then you also add the, the piece of the, the refresh and you're trying to do that newer tablets are coming into the environment. So we're really trying to do that. But until you hit that tipping point of devices, and if you've got three computers in the back of the room and you've got 27 kids, that's a really rough day for a teacher. So, so, so managing that change, I'm not saying that it can't be done, but it's gonna take some real strategy and some real planning around that to manage that tipping point. Um, if we could you know, wave the magic wand and have those devices for everybody and we could teach them how to use it and we, you know, I mean, it, we, we've gotta get ahead of that curve and ahead of that plan and craft that transition plan, so. But, but I guess my, the way I'm thinking about this is you've already got a bunch of devices in your schools and most of them are required to be in a locker room or turned off or you know not taken out during class and you got a bunch of devices right there ready willing and able if you can figure out a way to harness that and not kind of take an attitude of no we're not gonna don't use those and I think the I think the key thing was by the bond passing and getting us a network infrastructure that can allow us to use those devices safely in the school, not using the cellular plans. There's an advantage that we're going to have coming down the road. That's why we're seeing an explosion in devices coming to the schools, because we now have wireless access in some of those buildings, and they're they're wanting to put technology in the classroom, and we need it for curriculum purposes, we need it for assessment purposes. There's just a lot of good reasons for it. But also, there's got to be support for that. And that's where we're really stretching it. And we knew that was going to happen. We, it's not like this was, oh, this is a surprise. We knew that when we, play, we started getting wireless in our schools, technology was going to advance. That's what we wanted to do. That's the foundation we were setting. I think the exciting thing is Dr. Jungman's been through some of this. He can give us some insight of what he's come from. We're looking at also using high school students in some of the high schools. There's maybe ways for us to ed take advantage of some yeah, kids, support. but we got to get we have to get the curriculum and, and do some things to make all that work first. Okay. Back to if I could talk about bandwidth. Uh, how long is the amount of bandwidth that we're buying going to last through the year? Are we going to have? I assume we're going to have to buy more every year. It will be an ongoing. It's an ongoing thing. You have a budget proposal that you see for bandwidth that's part of the things that we discussed in our bond initiative that we were going to have to do a bandwidth upgrade. We waited until this year to do that bandwidth upgrade because there wasn't any reason if we didn't have the wireless and the network infrastructure to support it. We're currently at max capacity at 500 megabit on our current bandwidth. We're going to go to double that. So I don't see us running out of that this next year. Okay, But I do think we'll be talking about it at the end of the next year because as it increases, then the demand and teachers will see that things work because that's been a stumbling block. People get excited about what they see in the ed tech training, they wanna do it, and then it doesn't work, and so you go back to the old, old system. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Kathy Gross for the Professional Development Committee recommendation. Again, this is one that you have seen before, but she'll update you on the current status. Members of the board, thank you for this opportunity to bring forward a lot of work that a lot of great people have put forth this year. What you have in front of you as attachments is the product 
of work of teachers and facilitators in the Department of Professional Learning to create a document that we feel is very functional, efficient, and um, honors the needs of the district's professional learning. Um, I would like to recognize the people who are present who have contributed to this document. document. My colleagues, Dr. Yonke and Dr. Quirk, helped me facilitate the PL advisory this year, for which I'm very grateful. And Kitty Lou Maxson and Meredith Burstein are both teachers who um, are elected members, one elected and one um, appointed member of our PL advisory. And they represent great um, professionals in our district. And I know all of them would have been here tonight if they could have been, but um, Kitty Lou and Meredith were the ones who were here to represent our work. So in front of you with the attachments, you have our organizational procedures and um, they are aligned with federal, um, actually not federal, but international standards from Learning Forward and then meet all the state requirements for professional development committees as well. And then the second attachment you have is our plan that will guide our work and our prioritization of funds for professional learning for this coming school year. So we're asking that you approve the 2014-15 professional learning, learning plan created by the PL advisory and endorse the alignment of the structure of site learning system, site liaisons, and district professional learning advisory members. At this time, is there any questions, comments, anything you'd like to ask? Okay, we will review this information. If we have questions, we will refer those to you in the next two weeks. Thank you Thank very you. much. Okay, we will move to 7.08, 6 through 12, English Language Arts, Major Instructional Goals. I'm going to turn it over to Allison Pilly, who um, moved from the Interim Curriculum Director to the Curriculum Director this past uh, year, and she'll talk to you about the 612 MIGS. Good evening, members of the board. I'm bringing forward the proposed uh, English Language Arts Major Instructional Goals for grades 6 through 12. Uh, this is in preparation for the secondary ELA adoption process that will begin this fall. A committee of stakeholders was convened to review the uh, former major instructional goals um, and standards and revise them uh, to align with the Missouri Learning Standards. I would like to introduce Debbie Lambeth, and she is our middle school CDC chair. Um, Jessica Matson is our high school CDC chair, and they were both instrumental in uh, this project. I would also like to recognize the work of the teachers in the curriculum department for their effort on this process, and we are looking forward to uh, reviewing resources and updating our uh, secondary ELA uh, resources this fall. I will answer any questions if you have any. Any questions? I, I think I just have one comment, a, a couple, couple comments. Um, and I'm sure you're develop I know your CDCs are extensive uh, groups of uh, individuals involving what parents, community members, building leaders, teachers, correct? Typically, um, the parents and community members don't sit on our CDC for our monthly meetings, um, but we do, for these purposes, seek input from external stakeholders. And then did teachers receive any additional stipend for uh, any, any kind of stipend, or did they do this on professional development days for the time involved in developing these? Um, our CDC chairs, they um, re both receive a stipend that's paid. Um, you, they receive a little bit higher stipend during the adoption years. Um, that's the years before, during, and after the adoption. And then the CDC committee members, this work was done during the, uh, they were given a half-day sub for their CDC meetings, and this work was done during the school day with this paid step, sub. It's additional work that they do for us because they're dedicated, mm -hmm. correct? Okay. And then last, I, I'm very impressed with your um, number five, that the English language arts MIGs have been aligned to a number of standards. Um, our show me standards, which have been in place, what, it's 1993 or I was a long time. Sure. <laughs> uh, still good standards, but still part of curriculum development in our district. And then the Missouri learning standards and common core. And then the national standards. I think that's something sometimes forgotten that in content areas, especially 
middle school, high school, those national standards are very important in curriculum development. So I think that's a good idea that you included those, and, and I appreciate seeing those. Thank you. Anyone else have any comment? Yeah, Mrs. Callan. When you say you seek input from other stakeholders, how do you do that? Like uh, if a parent or a, yeah, I mean, we're also talking about high school students, you know, how is that input sought? Well, for this process with, um, I feel like the process could be improved maybe moving forward. This was um, the first time I have been through the MIGS adoption. Um, but it was mostly with the parents and community members. It was after they had kind of been, been put together by the committee, emailing those other stakeholders, um, letting them know what process we were going through, asking them to review um, the goals and objectives, um, let them know what they were aligned to. Uh, we don't, I, we didn't get really um, any change feedback from that. Most of them were just, wow, we're really impressed with um, the goals that are set for our students. Um, but just wanting to get a few other eyes on the on the major instructional. So, goals. how do you think you change if you weren't happy with Ima? How would you change it's, it going forward? It's difficult to get parent participation at our CDCs, um, especially <coughs> when they're held. So, I moving forward, um, there are committees that are already formed of parents um, that other departments use. I I feel like we could definitely tap into those. Um, committees for this purpose. Uh, also, we don't do any kind of job of getting our students input on this, and um, we have a, a few avenues that we would like to explore to get that feedback. Okay, thanks. I, I would interject too that where we do like the better job is when we select the materials after the major instructional goals, which have to be aligned to those standards. So, getting their input on um, as, as you look at text, are they visual? Had a lot of success getting input in those avenues again with existing structures the parent advisory and the student advisory and having displays set out and having people be able to touch and hold and look and give some input on the materials rather than the MIGs so that phase seems to be a little bit more high interest uh, largely because there's stuff to look at um, you know we, we like this layout of the textbook better than this one this is too heavy you know those kinds of things Thank you very much, Ms. Pilly. Thank you, Mrs. Lambert. Okay, 7.09, Attorney Services for 2014-15, Mr. Chodas. Thank you. Um, this is an item we bring to the board each year about this time. Um, we've received a, an engagement letter from our attorney, Ellis Ellis Hammonds and Johnson. Uh, the proposed rates are identified in that letter of engagement. Uh, rates for the three partners and two of the four associates are increasing by $5 per hour. I calculated it's about 2.7% on average. Uh, rates for the remaining staff are unchanged. Um, the fees are in the 14-15 budget and um, I'll be glad to answer any questions. Questions? Comments anywhere on the board? Hearing none, thank you. 7.10 tuition rate for 2014 15, uh, and that would be Mr. Everest. Good evening, Madam President, members of the board. The action item before you is the tuition rate for 2014 15. Each year, the board establishes the tuition rate for non resident students. And our tuition rate is based on information provided by DESE. Uh, this rate was 8,494 in the current fiscal year. The latest information that we have indicates that that amount will be $8,606 for the following, for the 1415 year. And during the current year, uh, they, we have no non resident students admitted to the district. However, we're required to set this rate annually. Questions? Again, questions, comments? None. Thank you. <laughs> okay, back to Mr. Chodas. Uh, 7 Eleven, free and reduced lunch price. 
This is another annual uh, action item presented to the board. Um, the free and reduced lunch income criteria is established by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, so um, it is what it is. And um, if the board has any questions, uh, I've got Jeff Barnes here to answer them. So. Questions. I mean, this is set for us, right? There's no discretion at all. <coughs> very good. No questions, comments? Okay, well, thank you very thank much. You. So we'll move to 7.12, copy your agreement. And Mr. Pelletier is going to talk to us about <coughs> that. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, in front of you, uh, you have an action item to approve a new copy or agreement. Uh, back in April, we went out to bid. Uh, for a 36, 48, or 60 month commitment agreement, uh, we received seven proposals from five vendors. Uh, Copy Products, our current provider, uh, has been selected as the best proposal. Uh, the financial portion of the RFP was reviewed by me, and I had a committee of six people uh, review the contractor support and services portion of the RFP. Uh, the proposal that I have presented will be a 48-month agreement with costs totaling $1,203,871. Is there any questions or comments for Mr. Pelletier? Yes, Mr. How Lee? Many, how many copiers? Uh, 132 new ones, and there will also be an opportunity to uh, to place some used units from the current agreement it so it'll be about 178 mrs bush so the lease is based on number of copies not a base lease and a maintenance contract is that right no we pay for the copiers we pay a Buy lease the on copiers? them and then we pay a cost per copy as well no that we're not buying the copiers this time we're leasing them oh, yeah that's what i'm saying but the yeah. lease is based on number of copies only no, we pay a lease rate for the copiers, and then we pay pay a cost per copy charge. Cost as well. per copy is for for maintenance and yes. refills or whatever. Yes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Hearing none. Thank you. Okay. Seven uh, point one three Fremont Elementary addition renovation. Uh, Mr. Lent. Uh, thank you. Um, at the last board meeting. Uh, we, I had shared the uh, bids that we had received for the Fremont project, and uh, since that time, we reviewed several different op uh, options as we looked at this project. And um, the bulk of that time had been spent working with the architect and the contractor to try to determine if we could get an appropriate value in a value engineering approach to try to bring the project closer to budget. Um, it became evident uh, as we got uh, further into that process that we were not going to see an appropriate value um, in credit back to the district for changes to the project. Probably the uh, best example that I could give you is uh, as we looked at one of the option in reducing the number of rooms on the project the, uh, for reducing four rooms, the credit that we would receive back to the district was $534,000. Um, when we know that it clearly costs significantly more than that to build four classrooms. Uh, we are seeing closer to 50 cents on the dollar uh, in credits, and um, we believe that ha has uh, mostly to do with the amount of work that's currently out there and uh, what the subcontractors are involved in. Um, and based on the fact that the uh, project has come in at $1.3 million over over uh, our anticipated construction budget uh, administration is making the recommendation to reject all the bids uh, that we have for the project. Questions or comments at this time? Just a clarification. When we talk about value engineering, the way I understand that is we'll take something away from the project and we think that that should have X amount of value and, and, and what we're getting in, in the, the bids to take that away or how much we're gonna save, we're getting less than 50% of what we think we should be saving. 
by taking that away from the project. Is that? That is correct. The resident I mean, architect <laughs> shaking his head. So. When we it, w when we approach a project, typically you would use either add alternates or deductive alternates to attempt to protect your budget because those are hard numbers that you receive on bid day. Um, in a value engineering approach, you don't have those hard numbers. That's when you are negotiating with your apparent low bidder to see what adjustments you can make in scope to reduce your cost to try to bring things back to budget. So the, the low bidder would then have to go out to subcontractors and say, what would you, how much would I save if, if we chop this off and, and the exactly. numbers we're getting back are just not correct. And, and many of the items that you look at in value engineering uh, cross multiple trades as well. So that's why it takes additional time because there's many people involved in that process. Okay, thank you. Because of the fact that we uh, are making a recommendation to reject the bids, it didn't require us to ask for a special meeting as if we would have tried to proceed forward. Uh, but the bids were um, actually uh, opened on May 14th, and so um, I would actually ask if the board could uh, vote to reject those uh, bids this evening, as by the 24th, the, um, the bids would already have expired, and our legal counsel uh, prefers that we actually do a formal rejection of bids. So you're asking for us to vote, a vote this evening, is that correct? No, I don't think so. Yes, well, that's that's what our legal counsel would prefer. No, see, we we did the information item. We actually had an information item before. Then we brought it forward as a regular item. Then we postponed it <coughs> to figure out what to do. So we actually would require action this evening. So move Four. to accept a recommendation of the administration. Second. So we have a motion by Mr. Rosenberry. We have a second by Mrs. Callan. Mrs. Luton, are you prepared for us to vote? Okay. Thank you. <coughs> Moving to 7.14, authorization for application and reporting. Dr. Ritter is not here this evening, so we will just be moving forward with this. It is, uh, this is a request that the board designates a superintendent as the authorized person for assuring compliance. Uh, these are uh, items that uh, are just required. Each year, 7.14, we can just look at those together. 7.14, if you look at your board docs, you see there's a list included in the board item of uh, various expenditures, final reports related to the following, and then also 7.15, district compliance statements required, uh, state statute required for DESI reporting. So those two items, I guess, if you have questions that come up in the next two weeks, we can refer those to Dr. Ritter as he will return Monday. So uh, we'll just, any questions, comments? Does the it, compliance list goes from A to V. <laughs> okay. I mean, just noted. It designates the superintendent. It doesn't have a name. Yeah. So it would transfer. This transcends the new superintendent coming in. Yes. It just, okay, I, I, I assume so, yes, but I just want to make sure. The office. Yes. You know, the office officer. superintendent that is the way required. Wait, read. does want to make sure. We're submitting these reports to, to this evening. Okay, action item routine. We have several action routine action items pertaining to minutes from previous board meetings, personnel elections, promotions, and terminations. Do I hear recommendations to modify the minutes? Okay. <coughs> Hearing none, we will move to agenda item 9.0, public comments to address non-agenda items. We do have uh, one public comment to address non-agenda items this evening. So please, uh, 
Remember that it is inappropriate to address the board about individual students or staff members by name in open meetings, and please limit your comments to three minutes, and those minutes will be timed by the board secretary. At this time, we have Mary Byrne, and she has a non-agenda item response to uh, Mr. Hosmer's question regarding Common Core. The last time I was here, um, I was uh, sharing with you the negative effects of Common Core on our student performance scores statewide. And um, Mr. Hosmer asked me if I was sure that the Common Core standards had a relationship to workforce planning. I want to assure you I do nothing without extensive research um, because that was a comment I made that that was actually the purpose of, of the standards. And so I've compiled excerpts from 10 documents that I'd like to share with the board. Um, I'm not able to send attachments to the email, which would have shortened things here for you. But um, these excerpts then are, are very, through uh, various sources. The first is an excerpt from Mark Tucker's uh, letter to Hillary Clinton in 1998 that is describing a plan to remold the entire American education system for human resources development and refers to a national system of education in which curriculum, pedagogy, examination, and teacher licensure are linked to national standards. The next excerpt is from Achieve Inc.'s 2000, the year 2000 tax return in which Lou Gerstner, who's co-founder of Achieve and former director of McKinsey and Company, an international consulting firm, manages data systems for education to workforce globally. Page six describes the plan for standards assessments and, and accountability systems consistent with the Common Core Standards Initiative. So that's 10 years prior to the actual Common Core Standards Initiative being launched. Um, where Achieve Inc. was formulating this plan of an integration of standards, data gathering, and accountability systems. Then I also included the State Fiscal Stabilization Funds for assurances to show you the link between those two documents. Excerpts of a PowerPoint from the U.S. Department of Labor describing Missouri's role in developing a longitudinal system to link education data to labor data for workforce planning. An excerpt announcing a $9 million to develop Missouri's longitudinal data system, of which MOSIS is a component, and a description of the purpose of that grant from the National Center for Education Statistics. Um, let's see, I have an excerpt from Missouri's 2009 Workforce Data Quality Initiative grant application that describes linking education data with workforce training systems. Excerpts from 2007 ESP Solutions Group document, which has two graphics showing that data will be entered at the secretary's desk of the school for uh, processing and reading of reports at the federal level. Um, let's see, page 26 of that document identifies No Child Left Behind Act as the impetus for corporate collaboration to come together and form these systems. Uh, page 28 is designed to uh, show that there's a process of personal, personally identifiable Sorry, Dr. student Burn, level your, data. Dr. To Burn, the your time level. is up. Thank you. Um, so I'd uh, like to submit this for your further review. Thank you. Moving to section 10, 10.01, legislative update. So do we have legislative issues updates to be discussed by members of the board at this time? Anything? Nothing? Lots of bills on the governor's desk. Lots of waiting. Okay, very good. 10.02, future issues. Do we have any future issues that anyone would like to bring up at this time? One. Okay, hearing none, we'll move to 10.03. Other, do we have any other issues to be discussed by members of the board? Uh, I might add that I, I attended the leadership meeting. There were some good meetings there. Um, I always figure if I can come back with one or two good things that are happening in other districts, then uh, it's been a good, you've spent your time well. Um, one thing, um, and Jefferson City, did this and presented and they have an academy at their high school similar to what we're doing at, at Kickapoo but the one thing that I, I thought 
brought away from that is they take, as they talked about beyond high school and education beyond high school, they realize that most of their students in fifth grade as they're moving to middle school and they were starting to look at um, options of occupations and things that are going to be out there. And we talk about college, most students had no idea what college was besides uh, going to Hearns Arena or Faro Field. That's well, it's what they thought college was. And so they have t started a program, and I'm, I know this would be big for us, but we also, they take, they take every fifth grader to the University of Missouri for one full day, and there's one day schedule that they actually tour campuses, go to lecture halls, go to a dorm, go to um, um, and actual classrooms where classes are being held and they can and they get that coordinated, which is a lot of coordination. But they've just found then when you start talking about college, there's what is that and why would I need to go and it it just help them as they were developing these things with their academies and, and looking at um, uh, different types of, of ways that students would want to, how they were going to take their, their academic things in. Um, and they also had a, uh, from their Votech School Career Center, um, they actually, um, and I'm should have said to Dave Davis, was the HTV, that's probably the first thing we did in Spring, Springfield was project-based learning, and that started years ago before we knew what project-based <laughs> learning was. And that's really kind of where it started, but their, um, one of their classes at the Career Center, when they were developing websites and one of the assignments was you know just develop a website nobody was too excited and they've started developing 10 a year that businesses that have no website in the Jefferson City area can apply and then students are able to interview the people they're able to find out what they want and they just said that has made that whole um, experience, you know, 10 times of develop a website and I'll grade your website. And now, um, you know, so the, what we're doing, the same kind of thing we're doing here, but <coughs> that happen, it's real world experience, it's externships, it's working with the public, interviewing the people, they're coming in, seeing your work, critiquing your work, you're changing it, getting it ready. And the number of students that actually then are out doing, developing websites for people getting paid, getting jobs, but it was, um, I just thought, and that wasn't all, there's some other things that came back, but I thought it was very good and just an appropriate length of time so you don't get bogged down with too many meeting things. But some real good ideas that seem like um, this wouldn't be too hard to, accomplish and uh, and maybe we could um, I, I know we could do things uh, technology wise to take you to a campus but being there I think would be different and we I mean when we've got Drury Evangel MSU and OTC we've got different campuses with different options right here that might be something that we'd want to look at in the future I might add that the board was well represented at the MSBA Leadership Summit. Um, Mr. Lee was there, Mr. Renner, I was there. Uh, and Mr. Lee and I provided a presentation on teaching, learning, and assessment. Um, and I think that went very well. We had several individuals in attendance, and we had lots of questions and, and uh, interest in some of the things we discussed. Um, Mr. Lee was also, also, he was recognized at the conference <laughs> for his service to MSBA's past president. So he made us very proud in his work with MSBA. Is there anything else you want to add? No. It was, it's been a great four years with him. Okay. Uh, anything else?
Okay, so let's move to, to 11. Our, let's take a few minutes. Please take a minute to record items that you like, you felt worked at our meeting tonight, um, and then any suggestions for improvement. Uh, and then we will move into executive session this evening. We need a vote to go into executive, executive session, and the board will conduct an executive session following this meeting to discuss legal, real estate, personal, ma personnel matters as provided in section 610.021. One, two, three, and thirteen, RSM 